We have the best culture. In our culture, there is no place for a woman. The brutal gang rape of a 23-year-old girl on her way home from a movie triggered an awakening that took many by surprise. to the latest government figures one woman is now raped in india every 20 minutes jyoti soti thi to aankh khinchti thi tab mu kati mummy mummy taali kabhi ek haath se nahi basti dono haathon se basti hai हर कोई शरीफ लड़की होती है रात को नौ बजे मतलब नहीं घूमती जितनी बीस पंद्रह बीस मिनट गाड़ी चली है मैंने चलाई थी फ्लाइटें बंद कर दी थी उन्होंने भाई था मैंने जिस लड़के को मारा था जाके वो सीटों के बीच में छुप गया बस लड़की चिल्ला रही है बचाओ बचाओ मार्केट के पीछे लेके हाथ आ जा रहे थे बारी बारी से जो नाइल ने कपड़ा निकालने से करो उसने हाथ डाला कुछ ऐसी चीज थी अंदर से लंबी लंबी सी निकली थी अतड़िया ही थी कुछ द लेडी ऑन द अदर एंड वीकेंड से द गर्ल और वूमेन are more precious than a gem than a diamond if you put your diamond on the street certainly the dog will take it out you can't stop ek hi kalav dana ke mere beta ko bhagwan ne jab bura pa ka sara banya tha uta ke khanda pe jala dega usko humne dekha jala de आखिर बार जब हम उसको हॉस्पिटल में मिले उसने हाथ में हमारा हाथ लेके चुमा और बोला कि सॉरी मम्मी हमने आपको बहुत तकलीफ दिया आई एम श्योर so much Leslie for making the trip to join us today. Um I realize I was remiss in giving a trigger warning for that movie. Um the clip out there and I realize this is dealing with very sensitive issue for lots of people so if you need to take a break and step outside um please do so. Um So I thought I would start by um just letting the audience learn about a little bit about you. We saw with that clip about you and your filmmaking having social impact and that that was a really important part of everything that you've done. So could you tell us a little bit about your background and what got you into making films that were creating social change? Well, I hail from two troubled regimes. Um I was born in Israel and my south african father when i was 9 took the family to south africa and this was apartheid south africa so my formative years and childhood were spent in places where i had perforce to ask a lot of questions about things that appeared so odd and so unfair and so unjust like why did we have a black maid who lived in this tiny little room up above this very tall building we had an apartment in and why did she not live with her children and i i had this very kind of odd dichotomy um because i always wanted to be an actor that's what i started life doing um and as an actor you have a very kind of strong personal ambition um trajectory 
And I went to drama school, to university, did a, a BA degree, um, uh, honors degree in drama, and then started um, my career as an actor in a country where only whites came to the theater. And this was um, partly because the black people were not allowed to come into um, whites-only theaters. There were only two integrated theaters in the country, and I went and worked in one of them in Cape Town and realized that even though non-whites were allowed to come to the theater in the theater I worked in, because I, I refused, of course, to work in a theater that wasn't integrated, they still didn't come because they lived out in these, the equivalent of you know, reservations, townships, in abject poverty. Um, so I suppose throughout my background, there was always this question of seeing injustice abundant in, in the society around me, feeling like an outsider pretty much in every place I was living in. I was an outsider in England. Um, I was heavily criticized for bringing the British system of justice into disrepute by daring to make that film about the Birmingham Six. This was one of the um, most notorious miscarriages of justice in England. I was an outsider in India making <laughs> India's daughter and heavily criticized by a, a minority of the population in, in, in India, the trolls, basically. Um, <clears throat> the majority of people, um, um, both in India and the NRIs outside of India, hugely supportive um, of the film. But I suppose I've always been something of an outsider. But, you know, with, with luck, somehow, the very first attempt I made to... Uh, make a film that would lead to change was successful. I mean, successfully brought about some change. So I immediately knew that film was this powerful tool for change. And then uh, that's all I really wanted to do. And of course, having started out as an actor, I very soon decided I had to leave South Africa because there were only two theaters I could work in, only two integrated theaters in South Africa at the time I was, I was there. Um, and then as soon as, you know, this landlord problem hit my real life and, and I committed myself to two and a half years of uh, fighting this man, this psychopathic criminal landlord, um, I, I realized that there were bigger issues than my own personal ambition to, to act and indeed then found when I was able to, you know, get together a film about the subject that it was much more satisfying and rewarding being able to be the guardian of the vision of a story as opposed to be the vehicle through which the story is told and it's someone else's um, obsession that you're, you're serving in that way. Mm -hmm. And you've made a really powerful and thought-provoking movie with India's Daughter. And when I looked at the other films you made, and I've heard you comment on this, this was the first time that you made a documentary in the way that you did. And can you tell us a little bit about what drove you to make this movie? I'm very, very clear about what that moment of feeling impelled to go there and make this film was. What put the fire in my belly was the day that the protests turned violent. I had watched first the reports of this horrific, brutal, gang rape with its detail of those intestines being pulled out, which turned my stomach, of course. But to be honest, I wasn't that shocked. This wasn't a one-off situation. We hear about these brutal, hate-filled crimes commonly, relentlessly, in every single country in the world. What did startle me in the most positive way was the unique response to that gang rape. Somehow this case captured the imagination of the public, of the media, initially of the students, and I think actually that is a very significant fact. What took those students out there? It was the JNU University students who first came out onto the streets in such numbers. And what took them out there, of course, was empathy 
she was a student. They empathized, they saw it from her perspective. Empathy is a crucial word, and I want us to come back to that later, because this, of course, is, for me, the missing ingredient. Um, so they pour out onto the streets in unprecedented numbers, mm -hmm. and I am overawed with admiration and, and inspired, and I fall in love with these people, and there are men out there in droves, and women, and young people, and... I think, you know, to me, there's nothing as beautiful and uplifting as protests. Because when a multitude of people come together in a common cause and hold aloft the highest values that we should all be ascribing to, that we should all be working towards every minute of every day, it does lift the spirits and it gives you a, a sense of optimism. And then these peaceful protesters were attacked by policemen with lattes, these batons, and beaten, and there were tear gas shells flying, and uh, the um, water cannons. And I, I really felt that pain. These people who I'd been watching for a week, around the 23rd of December, that is when the government decided to crack down on this protest, they feared civil war, I suppose. And, and that is when I thought, if they can be out there in the freezing cold of December in Delhi, taking this punishment for something that they are the first country in the world, this is crucially important for us to remember. You know, I'm accused, actually, we'll come to this later, I'm sure, but I'm accused of being this gori, this white-skinned person mm -hmm. who went out there to shame India a conspiracy of shame. I went there to praise India. That's what took me there. Mm. I thought never in my life have I seen any country stand up with this degree of commitment and robust passion for the rights of women and girls. Mm. And I had been raped when I was 18 and I took it personally. They were fighting for me. And they went on for over a month. And what they should have done, of course, was embrace this film, take the, Lord, the, the plaudits that they deserved mm -hmm. to say, yes, now we would like to inspire the rest of the world to stand up too. Mm -hmm. Let's join hands because we all own this problem. Mm -hmm. Sadly, that didn't happen. Yeah, it, the powerful um, protest for sure that led you on this incredible journey. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the uh, choices that you made when you were making the movie, because I find that to be very powerful as well. Um, for example, you decided not to put your voice in anything. The story is very much told from the perspective of the people that were actually a part of it. Um, and that has a power in storytelling. So I'd like to just talk about that choice. I think... To be honest, it was partly a default position for me and partly a matter of sensibilities and taste. But it was a definite decision. The first thing I thought was, I'm not having a narrator in this and certainly not me asking questions and being a part of it in any way. Um, when I say it's a matter of sensibilities, I come from the world of feature films. I've never made a documentary before. I remember being bored, rigid watching documentaries, being led by the nose by these narrators who are filling you in on, you know, and now you, you'll need to know this before you, we get to the next bit. Boring, gaping yawns. And so, you know, I, I've never liked that as a device. And I come from the world of drama where you have characters interacting in a story arc and a, a narrative that, you know, drives the issues forward. And so that, to me, was a kind of no-brainer that, that mm -hmm. I would treat it in that way. Um, now, interestingly enough, I also decided that I would absolutely not recreate any of what happened on the night. Mm -hmm. So, you know, having said that I looked at it <laughs> as drama... I was hugely sensitive to the fact that I had a duty of care to the parents, that I did not want there to be any kind of recreation of 
what happened on the night, because apart from anything, you know, it would hurt the parents, it would limit the event. It's much bigger than just, you know, bodies and body parts fumbling. It's a much more serious um, uh, issue and needed the kind of treatment I thought that was imagistic that, you know, so, so I used those lights mm -hmm. crossing to kind of try and, and bring the sense of and shot it from her point of view to try and bring the sense of chaos and, and pain and, and panic. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly I did make the decision that I would only want to hear from the direct participants in the story. Mm -hmm. There's one exception to that in the film, and I have to tell you, I regret that exception. The BBC persuaded me that for an international audience, we needed a voice that put everything into a kind of context. So there is the Oxford expert, Dr. Maria Misra, who's a wonderful, very bright and fabulous woman, but I regret her being in the film because she's not actually of that world. And every time I see it, I think I shouldn't have compromised. I shouldn't have. Next time I won't. <laughs> well, we look forward to the next time, too. <laughs> so another um, quite astonishing but powerful part of this piece that you've made is the fact that you interviewed the rapist. You interviewed, I've, I'm told, quite a few, but the one that in the movie was the one that was actually participating in, in the, the violence that was perpetuated against this um, this woman, and I'm curious what you you were thinking before you got to the interview, and what changed after you interviewed these people. What was the learning process there? Huge. I mean, the first thing to say is that I suspect that if I hadn't got permission to interview the rapists, I probably would not have made the film. Mm -hmm. For me, there were three absolute imperatives in setting out and I thought about this very hard because I hadn't made a documentary before, so I was very assiduous and, and took it you know, very seriously um, in terms of what is my job here? What am I trying to do? So the three things I set out to do were one, to enhance the voices of the protesters who I had so much admiration and awe for, to put them at the very epicenter and, and pulse and heartbeat of the film, two, to flesh out who was this Nirbhaya, the fearless one, Damini, India's daughter. Of course, a, a rape survivor or victim is not allowed to be named under Indian law, so there were these you know, pseudonyms for her. Who was she? We knew one sentence about her from all of the media that I read, mm -hmm. and I read everything that was written before I set out. Um, she was 23 years old, she was a medical student, some said a physiotherapy student, she went to see a movie, Life of Pi, with a friend in a mall. That was it. This life that had been lost, what was it? What were her hopes, her aspirations? What kind of person was she? What have we lost? So to flesh her out was the second most important imperative and, and kind of leg of the film for me, and the third and I have to say the most important, because this is where we start to think about how can we change these men or how can we change uh, these violations of human rights um, that are so relentless across our world, was to understand the rapists, mm -hmm. to know what it was that they had as sets of attitudes that enabled them to so flagrantly you know, fly in the face of civilized, caring, respectful behavior. Um, and so, what did I expect? I expected that I would get an answer and an insight into what makes these particular men able to pull out the intestines of a woman having gang raped her and then tossing her onto the side of the road naked and bleeding. The answers for me, first of all, I must say, lay beyond them as individuals. Because the first thing that struck me very uncomfortably was that the monsters the media had prepared me for these monsters who, not content with raping her, 
disemboweled her, ripped her intestines out of her body with their bare hands. All those headlines led me to believe I was going to be sitting with psychopaths. Not one of the seven men I interviewed was a psychopath or even abnormal. These were normal men. They were ordinary men. I would say two of them were sensitive men. And they were certainly all polite. So it would have been much more reassuring and comforting to me if they had been the monsters I was expecting. Mm -hmm. But therein lies the huge insight. Because in that reversal of expectation, I understood, and in the 150 questions that I had for each one of those seven rapists, and I interviewed them for 31 hours. Mukesh Singh, 16 hours over three days. I knew everything there was to know about what he thought about women, who he, the first woman he ever set eyes on was, who the, I mean, a myriad of questions. And I understood absolutely clearly that these men have all been programmed like robots. Socio-cultural thinking has given them the attitudes that they hold and has evidenced for them on a daily basis since the day they first drew breath in the world that women are subordinate, that girls are of lesser value, that they're destined for a particular kind of life, which is basically to you know, be passed on to another family, serve that husband, that, those in-laws, and that family. And it's our fault that they do what they do because we don't intervene, we don't break the cycle. It's our responsibility. We are accountable to the children of the world. And we sit back and we complacently say, but it's the parents. The parents have to do this. For the most part, the parents are incapable of doing this because they themselves have not been taught. They themselves are in the grip of this discriminatory mindset. And we'll talk, I hope, in, in the course of this discussion about the solution, but that is how I came to it. And if I may, and I know I'm so garrulous and I talk so much, but one last thing on uh -huh. this point, <laughs> because we're talking about the reversals of the expectations and the insights. There's one more crucial insight. Mm -hmm. They, actually three, very quickly, they felt no remorse. You see that in the film, not a second of remorse did any of these seven men display? Why? Because they genuinely don't believe they've done anything wrong. They think she's done something wrong. She broke the diktats of patriarchal society. She was out at night with a boy who was neither her husband nor her brother. She was a slut, clearly, so she was asking for it. Good girls, and there are only 20% of girls are good, the rapist tells us. Uh, good girls don't go out at night after dark. Um, I also didn't feel any anger, despite the fact that I had been raped when I was 18, and I thought I might even physically assault mm -hmm. one of these rapists. Mm -hmm. Anger didn't even surface as an emotion for me, because it was so clear, as I say, that they were programmed. But the biggest insight of all, looking at these seven men, I'm trying to find what is the common thread amongst them. And the first thing that strikes me between the eyes is, of the seven, only one has finished secondary school. And of course, I know they all come from, you know, very poor, depressed economic and social conditions. And I think, well, of course, you know, it's the lack of education that they all pretty much have in common. And then I interview their lawyers. So, I understand immediately, and this was the biggest insight of all, it's nothing to do with access to education. And that puts the spotlight straight onto, when we say education, what do we mean? We mean numeracy and literacy. We mean preparing children and youth for a life in a labor market. We mean giving them skills, giving them knowledge of that kind. Where are they to pick up empathy? 
and perspective taking and compassion and critical thinking and conflict resolution, emotional intelligence, identifying emotions. Where are they to pick this up from? Certainly not out of the ether. And as educators, we have failed them absolutely negligently. Yeah, that Thank powerfully you. said. Thank you. Um, I want to talk about a couple more things before we big warmer and we talk about the bigger context of Canada. Um, the ban. So your movie, your piece of art that was made to actually advocate for these voices that needed to be heard was banned in India. Uh, I think out of a sh great shock to most people that this would be banned, especially in the light of the fact that we're exposed to so many things in the world. What do you think it was about this movie and this topic that um, got such heavy-handed treatment by the government? It is so complex that we could actually spend an hour talking about just this one point. But just to give you a little glimpse into how complex it is, mm -hmm. who do you think first called for the ban? Love to know. There were about 20 Indian prominent feminists who got together and saw this film. People who are like the Gloria Steinem of India. Yeah. Vrinda Grover, Urvashi Bhutalia, Kavita Krishnan, Indira Jai Singh, I mean names that are held in great esteem, they first called for the ban. It is so complex, this issue. Now, why did they? I was given several reasons, amongst them your hair will stand on end, but I was told by one of them that the reason they were so angry with me was that I chose the 8th of March, International Women's Day, to release the film on. And they, I, I should have known about all the events that they had planned for that day. Hmm. That was one reason given to me in front of more than 200 Oxford students. And thank God they were there, or I would have thought I had lost my mind. Um, another reason was that I came in, Kavita Krishnan said, this foreigner knowing nothing about the feminist movement in India, and nowhere in the film did I lay out all the hard work and the gains and the... So we're talking about territory and ego. Another reason was I used the word daughter in the title. They were furious with me for that, because daughter is patriarchal language. Forgive me, I said, I didn't know that we should grace patriarchy with ownership of language. So all sorts of, all manner of reasons have been given by various people. The police sent me an email in telling me that the film was banned, saying that the reason for the ban as far as they were concerned was that the film would lead to a disruption in law and order. So I thought, ah, so you're fearing more protests. The, in, in the parliament, the Lok Sabha, I was in Delhi when the ban was pronounced. I was actually there cutting the Indian version of the film because I had to remove her name from the Indian version. There were a few changes I had to make, but that version never got seen, of course. Um, so I'm watching proceedings in the Indian parliament the day of the ban, and there are ministers in high dudgeon screaming about the tourist industry being decimated by the film. That, I think, was, you know, a, a big reason. But then there are also these reflex instincts, you know. There is a colonial history. There is a big chip on the shoulder. They thought I was British. They were wrong, but they thought I was British, so this British person is coming in, you know. Mm -hmm. All of those resonances, I think just, you know, all added to it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, for me, the bottom line is they don't want to look in the mirror. And the film shows the mirror. Mm -hmm. So we um, take pride in the fact that we can contribute to this global conversation that you're not allowed to have in India because of the ban. So if you were going to say something to the Indian government and its people about this ban, what would you say? I would say, Think about the fact 
that some months ago, because one of your MPs sat watching pornography in the Lok Sabha on his mobile phone, some months ago, 897 pornography sites were banned in India. My heart actually leapt with joy when I heard that because I know the part pornography plays in the dehumanization of women. Within one week, there was such an outcry on social media by Indian men saying, we are a democracy. Democracies don't ban things. The government reversed the ban within one week. So I would say if you can do that with those pornography sites, you can certainly do that with a film that simply echoes what Dr. Ambedkar, who was one of the founders of the Indian constitution and state said, which is we will measure the progress of our society by the progress of our women. You can lift the ban, you must lift the ban, and what you should do is take your rightful place as the country that led the world by example with those protests for over a month, which were the most laudable, respect-worthy, inspiring protests, and let us all join hands across the globe because this is a global pandemic. Let us all join hands and find ways of fighting this and, you know, working towards a free, just, and equal world for women and girls. Um, now, this movie is not just about India. Um, and I know that you, at the very end of it, you show some stats about different countries, about what's going on there. This is really a global problem. Um, I would like to introduce Lorimer to come to the stage, but before I do, um, I wanted to read out a little bit about him. Now, in Canada, on India's Daughter's website, which I encourage everybody to take a look at, there are some stats about um, Canada and our place in all of this. And it says there that about two and a half million, there were about two and a half million reported rapes, and that's estimated that only 6% of women report rapes. So that means that one in 17 women in Canada are raped. Um, clearly, we have our own shame to deal with. Um, and on that note, I'd like to introduce Laura Mershainer, uh, another very special guest into this conversation. Laura Mer is a self-described recovering police officer. He joined the Vancouver Police Department as a constable in 1991, contemplating or completing assignments um, like the Prostitution Task Force and the Homicide and Missing Persons. Lorimer undertook numerous undercover assignments in drug, sex work, and homicide films over the course of his career. In 2015, he wrote a critically acclaimed book called the, That Lonely Section of Hell, the botched investigation of a serial killer who almost got away. Um, the book is a memoir of his work on Vancouver's missing and murdered women file. I'd like to invite him up to read from his book. Thanks so much, Nikki. Is this on? Okay. I always struggle to um, pick a selection, you know, depending on the crowd and depending on what we're talking about. Um, because there are, are so many intersecting issues uh, that come into play with my book and the kinds of places I get invited. So um, I'm, I'm so in awe of Leslie and her work. Uh, I'm, 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 hi I'm hiding it really well, but I'm just so excited to be on the same stage with her. And uh, I think that part of what is uh, exciting for me is that she's an artist who's using her art uh, for social change, which is uh, really where I would like to go um, in my journey as a recovering cop. So I'm going to read you uh, the, preface, the preface to my book. Oh, I'm stepping on the court here, sorry. Um, and uh, because it seems appropriate to me tonight, and you can decide whether you agree or not. Pincher Creek, sorry. Pincher Creek, Alberta, summer 1990. The white Econoline rumbles around Highway 507 in the early morning sunlight. I squint. 
vowing to find my sunglasses when I, stand, when I stop to gas up for my trip to Calgary to deliver the negatives for the next edition of the Pincher Creek Echo. I enjoy the weekly adventure. While the Calgary printer churns out the, rep the papers, I spend eight to 10 hours with my friends playing basketball and catching up before heading back south to Pincher Creek in the late evening, loaded down with papers filled with stories I have written for distribution the following day. As I drive east, a flock of sparrows, there must be more than a hundred, takes flight from a ditch to my right toward the road in front of me, angling to cross in front of my van. For one hopeful moment, I reassure myself that they will easily clear the van. The next instant, I realize with horror that they will not. Pop, 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 pop. Bird after tiny bird pel pelts the windshield and grill and front bumper as I fight to maintain control of the wheel, resisting the instinct to veer into the oncoming traffic in an effort to save them. My hands are shaking. I pull off the highway at the town's last gas station. Small, imperfectly, sorry, small, impossibly perfect bodies litter the windshield. Why? You could have so easily saved yourselves. Just a little more altitude, a little more speed, and you were good. Why? I imagine them lying in a nest as eggs, working hard to hatch, learning to fly under the watchful eye of their parents, only to end up like this. One minute, soaring in flight, the next dead, stuck fast to my van. Bile rises in my throat. I pick the first still body off the windshield and gently hold it in my palm. It is still warm. I marvel at the total absence of blood or visible injury and say a silent prayer of thanks, though I no longer have religion. In no time, I hold a small stack of four tiny birds in my hand and look around for something to put them in. The bell on the station door startles me, and I turn to see a petite, middle-aged woman walk out toward me. Her efficiency both comforts and alarms me, as though she encounters such events often. Oh my goodness, let's get those poor things off of here, she says as she begins gently plucking one flawless body after another from the grill. Dumb with grief, I shake my head. She glances into my eyes and continues her grim harvest. I thought they would make it, I offer. I thought they'd clear the van. They just, my throat constricts with emotion. They just flew straight into the van. She straightens up from the grill and faces me. I do taxidermy. I can keep them in my little fridge for the day and take them home if you like, she suggests. It feels strange to think of myself as their guardian, the next of kin to these little creatures I've only known in the briefest of seconds of life and the finality of sudden death. Uh, sure, that would be great, I answer. But, I mean, I don't think I need to get them back from you after. I worry she has mistaken me for someone who would want a reminder of this day, someone who mounts dead birds on their wall. I understand, dear, she assures me, patting my arm with the hand not full of birds. I'm happy to keep them. Thank you for helping me with this. It's my pleasure. I believe then that it truly is. She takes the birds into her office, and I fill the van's tank. I stare at my face in the mirror as I wash my hands in the station's filthy washroom sink. How can it be that I detect no outward evidence of the utter helplessness and despair I feel? How will I wear this irrational cloak of failure? Thank you, Lorimer. Um, so I'm happy to be joined in conversation with you three, um, with the Canadian context, but also your global initiatives. I'd like to talk a little bit about truth seeking. Um, and from both of your work, you've spent a lot of time seeking the truth to uncover these things in our society that need to be talked about. But in the context of that, you've encountered monsters, the, the most horrific sides of human nature. Um, and from your learnings, I wonder what you could tell us about how we change that. How do we change society? And what brings about these monsters in us? Well, I was really struck by what Leslie said about meeting with these, with these uh, men that, that she interviewed for her documentary. And, and I had the same experience um, when I met Robert Picton, who was um, uh, responsible for the deaths of a lot of the women in the Vancouver 
in the Vancouver Missing Women investigation. And, you know, he was just a sad little man who had a sad little life. And I, I, I like you, I didn't feel a lot of anger. I didn't feel a lot of anything, really. Um, you know, just, uh, and I think that it, it's, maybe that speaks to that empathy piece a little bit. I was very intrigued by what you said about that, Leslie, because I know that um, when I look at uh, the kinds of people that do these kinds of things, I feel that there's, there's always a, a piece um, where somehow that person somehow detaches themselves from the victim, somehow finds a way to other that victim, yes. whether it's through gender, whether it's through color, whether it's through circumstance. You know, I look at it a lot through the lens of policing, and I see that, you know, we, can, we only have to look to what's happening in the U.S. in the last, well, I mean, since slavery, but recently, you know, with the attention being drawn to, to police shootings in the U.S. And it's that othering that makes it possible to kill people, to harm people, to diminish people's experience, and to not see it in the same lens as our own experience. And I think that's, that's the piece that, that needs to be taught. And when you talk about teaching kids, um, teaching boys and young men empathy, it's, it's to see the common in all of us. And, and it, it seems so basic. It, it's frustrating to me that it's such a, a basic lesson that we're all the same, we all do the same things every day, and yet somehow these, these monsters, if you want to call them that, these people, these very damaged, sad people, have that ability to just put that person on an, a, a different enough level that then they can do these things to them and not, and not feel it in some way. 100%. Um, one of the rapists I interviewed who was not involved in the gang rape and murder of Jyoti. His name was Gaurav. He was 34 years old. He had been in prison for five years at that point of a 10-year sentence. And he had raped a five-year-old girl. And I interviewed him for three hours. He told me absolutely every detail, casually told me how he had taken her from both sides described everything about this little girl. And at the end of the interview, it was actually the most chilling moment of my whole life. He had been sitting through the interview for these three hours. And towards the end, I said to him, um, Gaurav, how tall was she? And he stood up out of his chair, and with this strange smile playing on his face, which had been there the whole interview because he was nervous in front of the cameras, he stood up and he went like this. With this half smile. I mean, it was just so chilling. And I then said, look, I really, please, I beg you to help me here because I can come with you a certain distance of this journey you were on that night. I know you had a fair bit to drink. I know everything about, you know, what you did and how you put your hand over her mouth and her eyes were wide with fright and you kept her nose free so she could breathe. He t all the details he told me. I know what you were feeling at the moment you were looking at this little creature, thinking about what you wanted to do to her and you were hot and you had this, you know, you needed to get this out of your, your body. But what I cannot now do is go that extra step. I can't go from imagining being you, looking at this little creature, wanting to do this, and then actually doing it. So how do you cross that line? Just take me through that. And he looks at me like I am off another planet and completely insane for asking such an utterly stupid question. And he says, word for word, he says, she was a beggar girl. Her life was of no value. That is the other. That is the other of missing women and girls, uh, um, indigenous women and girls. Did, did some, I think there was a, someone at that door, was there a? 
Oh, three minutes. Okay. 30 minutes. <laughs> oh, we're okay then. We're okay. <laughs> Um, so, you know, that it's exactly what you're talking about. That little girl had a double whammy. Number one, she was a girl, so she was of no value. But she was a beggar girl, so she was of absolutely no value. So you can do what you want with her. When the Hutu regime in Rwanda wanted the Tutsis murdered, what did they do? They waged a six-month radio campaign, propaganda campaign, calling the Tutsis cockroaches and dogs, so that the Hutus could simply stamp them out. Mm. When ISIS beheads people, how can they do that with such equanimity? Because they're of a religion that is of no value. And that's what it's, you know, at, at the basis, not just of gender-based violence, but all violence that, you know, vests in discriminatory mindset on the basis of sexual preferences or religion or race or that's what it's about so how what do we do about it well when you see the problem as i have seen it in such starkly defined terms as is you know laid out in this film the solution just looms at you and exactly as Lorimer has just said it is so obvious it is so simple but we have never taken a step towards it. We have sat and talked about this for generations, no millennia. 2,400 years ago, Aristotle said, education of the head without education of the heart is no education at all. 1924, the Geneva Convention on the Rights of the Child Beautiful, eloquent language about how important it is to imbue children with a sense of respect for others, celebration of the diversity of all peoples. We, we've done nothing about it. We've irresponsibly ignored this missing subject, the missing third dimension to education, which is social and emotional learning. So I have committed myself to an initiative called Think Equal. The film is the birth mother of this initiative. And I'm advising the UN Human Rights Office on it and working with them on the initiative. We have gathered together experts and visionaries in the field of education, gender, human rights, neuroscience and psychology. We have your own extraordinary Mary Gordon from Roots of Empathy on our committee, and Roots of Empathy is a partner. She is twice Order of Canada for the amazing work she does on empathy. We've got Sir Ken Robinson, who's one of the greatest educationalists in the world on our committee. Yu Wei Zhu from China, Urvashi Sani from India, Ashoka Fellows, Brookings Fellows, We've partnered with Yale University Center for Emotional Intelligence and their co-directors. One is a patron, one is on our committee. Meryl Streep is a patron. President Joyce Banda. We have gathered together the most extraordinary people. We have now designed the 160 lesson plans of the first curriculum in comprehensive social and emotional learning, four hours per week, for three-year-olds. Wow. And we have to start when they are three because neuroscientists tell us, and again, Aristotle said the same thing 2,400 years ago. He was right. He was a bit optimistic, actually. He said, give me a child until he is seven, and I will show you the man. Neuroscientists tell us that by six, the character is formed. That child is in default wiring. It's between three and five that the brain is still neuroplastic and optimally cognitively modifiable so we can change behavior, we can change attitudes and this discriminatory mindset. So that is what we're gonna do. 
we're going to persuade and inspire education ministers and heads of state around the world to co-opt as compulsory from the first day of education of a child this missing subject. And we're going to bring this new subject onto the compulsory curricula of world schools. And that will solve the problem. Thank you. Incredible, incredible. Um, I'd like to talk a bit about justice. Um, both of you operated in that field. Um, and also, justice seems something that eludes a lot of victims of sexual assault. And I just have some stats here on Canada. Out of the 460,000 women on Stats Canada that reported being sexually assaulted, about 15,000 reported it to the police, and only about 1,500 resulted in convictions. So clearly this is happening with impunity in our country. And that is 3% are reported, mm -hmm. and 0.25% mm -hmm. result in a conviction. And in my mind, it's shocking, because if that had been the case for any other major crime, there would be protests in the street every day to stop it. So I, I pose the question, what do you think it is about women not wanting to um, come forward with their abuse and society not handling it properly? Well, I think from my perspective in policing, um, you know, I, I see a lot of different things. For one thing, there is such a, a, a diversity and, and disparity of experience that women, we'll say women because it's you know, predominantly women, obviously, that are sexually assaulted. But women's experience when they come to a police department, if they come to a police department, but if they actually go in the door and, and want to report a sexual assault, right away it's a crapshoot as to who they get. Uh, I'd like to say it's better if they get a woman detective, but it isn't always because, again, the experience for minorities in policing is, is hellish. And, and even though police uh, recruit visible minorities and women and want them in their ranks, um, or at least say they want them in their ranks, as soon as those people get in the door, they're still minorities and they're confronted by a police culture that that doesn't want them to express their minority status, that doesn't want them to speak for women or speak for people of color or anything else. They want them to assimilate into the police culture, which again perpetuates this otherness. So let's assume then that a woman does get into the police department as a victim of crime, as a victim of sexual assault, and, 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 want, and starts her process of going through the court system. It's incredibly difficult because the police are still a reflection of society. You know, I, I'm not a police apologist by any stretch, but the fact is they are influenced by rape culture the same way as everybody else. So right away, the questions, they think that they are um, being very uh, um, conscientious and, and dotting the I's and crossing the T's by asking questions like, what were you wearing? And how much did you drink? And where, where did you go? And how come, if you'd been out with him before and it was a negative experience, you went out with him again? And all those questions that, that police, we would like to say, are doing due diligence from an investigative perspective, are, they're just perpetuating rape culture. And the reason those questions are asked is because the legal system expects those questions to be asked. And the legal system will hold those detectives to account if they don't ask those questions because the case will get tossed out because those things haven't been covered off. So you see this whole system is predicated on placing the onus on the woman to prove the case, which Let's face it, there is, that is something that has to happen. But in my experience, um, if, if there were ever a situation where a woman, a woman came in uh, and, and reported to me or anyone around me um, of a sexual assault that turned out to not be true, it was sniffed out in a very, very short period of time, usually within the first interview. Okay, So these are not cases that typically get to court where you know, the, uh, as we heard in the Gameshi case, you know, this, this, this um, demonized or, or angry woman sets out to ruin somebody's life. That, that, that scenario, that whole trope is not, is not reality. And so part of the problem that I see is that women are not stupid. And they see these, they know about these stats. They talk to their friends. You know, we sat in the green room and, and 
several of us talked about rape experiences and, and how, I think, save for one of us, we didn't report it. And, there, and it's not because you're afraid, it's because you see the way the system plays out. You see what's in store for you when you come forward and go down that road. So what I think has to change is that reporting has to be, society has to change the questions we ask of women. It has to change the playing field in which interaction in power dynamics happen so that there's not those questions that don't, that don't, that don't get asked, which is questions like, well, this guy, what kind of power was this guy exerting over this woman? What was his relationship? Why did he feel like this was an okay thing to do? And put the onus on the perpetrator as opposed to the onus on the victim to have to prove all the reasons why she shouldn't be sexually assaulted instead of asking the men, well, what made you think you were entitled to that? And so reporting is a very complex piece, but I think, I mean, I'm just blown away by that initiative, Think Equal, because, I mean, that's where it has to start. It has to start and change attitudes from such a young age so that girls don't feel, young girls and women don't feel that, that right away they're questioning, they're like, oh, what did I do? I'm going to get in trouble because I really shouldn't have done X to put me in that position. You know, you, you can tell girls till you're blue in the face. You know, I have a 10-year-old daughter. I can tell her till I'm blue in the face that, you know, come forward and if something bad happens to you, you have to tell someone, you have to tell someone, you have to tell someone. But these, these messages aren't lost on, on young girls. They know. They think right away, I'm going to be in trouble. And that has to change. And also there's just the very natural human instinct, which is, you know, as, as I know from my own case, where I didn't report, I'm ashamed to say, for 20 years, um, where you just, you regret a traumatic incident. You want to forget about it. You want to move on. That's your natural instinct. Even if you've just gone to the shop and broken your leg, you think, why the hell did I go to the shop? Did I have to go at eight in the morning? I didn't really need that pint of milk, or whatever it is, you know? And in my case also, I was so convinced this guy was gonna kill me after he raped me, that when I got away with my life, I was so grateful to be alive that I thought, well, at least I was only raped. Forget it, just bury it, move on. You know, so there are all of these factors. But I think, I mean, you've said everything so utterly, completely and eloquently about it, I don't feel I need to add anything to that other than, that, other than to say that, you know, what we do as a world is deal with the fallout of this disease. We're constantly talking about building more shelters, building more prisons. Um, how do we deal with encouraging girls to report, let us stop the focus on that entirely, as, as uh, sorry, not entirely, uh, what's the word, exclusively. We have to do that, of course. But let us also start very seriously focusing on prevention. I just want to add a quick a quick point to what you said, Leslie, because I was just at a, a conference in Hamilton a couple of weeks ago, um, an Indigenous Intersections conference that was put on by McMaster University and their Indigenous Studies program. And, and it was fantastic. They had a lot of frontline Indigenous um, uh, social workers, mental health workers, violence prevention workers, and they were talking about their work in their communities. And they were, you know, I, I have so much respect for Indigenous peoples in Canada because they are just taking the bull by the horns and fixing these problems themselves because for so long no one has helped them. And they are working, you know, instead of hearing these statistics that, and I don't even remember what the statistics are, but that a good percentage of the violence against Indigenous women is perpetuated by Indigenous men, instead of taking offense to that or, or questioning those, those statistics, they said, Okay, maybe that's somewhat fair. Let's work on our men. And that's, and that's what they're doing. And they're doing fantastic things from a trauma-based perspective where they're taking indigenous men who are, uh, most of them, you know, in some way very negatively impacted by residential schools, and they're helping them with their own mental health issues and their own issues around family violence or around partner violence. 
and they're empowering them to take responsibility for their own actions and their own behavior in relationships. And guess what? It's benefiting Indigenous women. And you know that's, that's exactly what we're talking about mm -hmm. here, I think. Excellent. I, I just want to ask one more question before we open it up to the audience. I have about 10 minutes of questions and answers. Um, and both of your stories take us to very dark places about human nature um, and take us to confront these monsters. And I wanted you to leave us with an idea of what gives you hope that things will change in the future? What gives me hope is um, the absolute certain knowledge that this can be fixed and that it is so easy to fix. And I really mean that. Um, in one year, we have actually got the first curriculum. We have 56 schools across 17 countries starting to pilot this curriculum from January of next year. So that gives me hope. It's concrete, it's real. We do need an extraordinary amount of support and help, and I urge everyone here to lobby, advocate, lobby your um, members of parliament, your federal, your provincial um, MPs, um, and demand this missing piece for our children. Um, it's got to be top down. We cannot rely on parents or schools to opt in or out. If it's compulsory for a child to learn mathematics in order to lead a productive life, it has to be compulsory for a child to learn the value of each and every human being. And that is what we must demand. Well, I'm encouraged, I'm like most of you, I think, that's, this is the first I've learned of Think Equal, and I'm, I'm, I want to sign up in, in whatever way that I can, um, because You're this, in. This, good, because this, uh, I have often wrung my hands over this issue, and, and I think most people have, and uh, the thing that I, I have found heartening in the last, I guess, year or so that I've been, been speaking publicly around my book and, and, and these issues is that these conversations are happening and, and they're not, uh, you know, not to diminish women's studies programs at all, but they're not just happening in women's studies classrooms anymore. They are happening everywhere with men, with young people um, in bigger and bigger venues and bigger forums with people of influence who can actually make a difference, who actually have resources to put towards making a difference. And I think that's, it sounds like that's exactly what, what you're doing. And, I, and that, that encourages me. It, that, and I feel that knowing that it is so fixable is, it, it just makes everyone want to jump on board, I think, a lot more. So I want to thank you for that. Thank you. Okay, great conversation. Just so you know, Lorimer and Leslie will be out in the lobby for the next uh, few minutes at least. So if you want to meet them or have another question for them, then they're available for that. Um, th that's our time. I want you to thank you both to our guests for your powerful words and participating in the conversation.